saith who? The Lord. I'm glad God is in the reasoning business. Because if I was God, I'd be in the lightning rod throwing business. Zap, zap, zap. But I'm glad he's Lord and I'm not. And you are, and you better be glad that he's Lord and you're not. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff we wouldn't put up with if we was God. But the Bible says, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Now watch what the Bible says. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come in your house and worship you today in this Christmas season. And I pray, God, that we would be able to magnify that this morning. And God, you'd touch our hearts from your word. I pray that you'd speak to us. And Father, that you'd do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. We'll be careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. And all God's people said... I mean, you can be seated. You like how I said that? Because I'm used to y'all standing up, amen? Y'all must have been wore out like I am this week, amen? So when you get to Isaiah chapter number one, God's dealing with the nation of Israel as a whole. And if you studied the nation of Israel, I mean, it's off and on. They're right with God. They're in rebellion. They're right with God. They're in rebellion. And what he's doing in chapter number one is God is laying out her iniquities. And it's fourfold, if you would. He said he talks about Israel's rebellion. Rebellion is turning away from God and turning to something else other than God. So he deals with her rebellion. But not only was Israel in rebellion, but in chapter number one, you'll find that she was also rejecting God's laws. It's much like America today, rejecting the laws. If you was in Sunday school this morning, you know, that's the problem we have. We have gutless and spineless prosecutors and attorneys that will not hold the law into account. That's the problem we're having. There's laws that are on the books, but people break them every day because who's going to enforce them? But I'm going to tell you something. Even though man may not enforce our laws that are on the books, there's a God in heaven that will will enforce his laws that is on his books one of these glad glorious days and so that you see that they have rebelled they've rejected the laws of God but then they've also resisted God's correction it's amazing to me how God could be so merciful and so great and such filled with such grace that he would be interested in correcting man and then man turn around and see that mercy and that grace and just spit in the face of God and turn his back on God's correction I think if God's trying to get your attention and God's trying to correct you, then you need to heed God. Amen. There's enough in this life against me. There's enough in this world that I have to face. The last person that I want to be on the naughty list with is God. Amen. I mean, it's one thing if the devil's after you, but it's another when God's after you. And so that's what's going on. You see her iniquities. And then here's what God's response was to the nation of Israel here in Isaiah chapter number one. Number one, he said, I will reject your sacrifices. I'm going to tell you, there's a point in the time in a man's life where God will be tired of hearing, I'm sorry. I, one of the greatest messages I heard preached, Brother Mark Stroud preached it years ago, and he preached on the subject, the title, When Sorry Isn't Enough. When Sorry Isn't Enough. God said, I'll reject your sacrifices. God said, I will refuse your prayers. And I will pour out my anger upon you, and all your sins will completely be destroyed. So he deals with their iniquities, but in, in the latter part of chapter number 1, when you're coming down, I guess the middle part of chapter number 1, when you come down to verse number 18, you see where God is giving an invitation. God is giving an altar call, if you would. You can't find altar call in the Bible, but I can show you where God wants man to draw nigh to him so that God... God can draw nigh to man. And in verse number 18, the Bible says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And by the way, God's not interested in your reasoning. He's interested in his reasoning. It's either God's way or it's the highway. I mean, if you want to go your way, God will reject the sacrifice. God will reject the prayer. God will pour out his anger. But the invitation, God's urging his people.
people to do one thing and that is to repent and a repentance is a return to him promising God said I will restore you God said I will make you complete again he said if you'll repent he said your sins are are red like uh, crimson he said your skins are or your sins are uh, red like scarlet and he's laying out this foundation he said and you you are you are in a bloody red mess you know a lot of times we look at sin as being black God sees sin as red say so why is that so that when the blood of Jesus comes upon you, what sins are you talking about? Amen? If I had two pieces of red cellophane tape this morning, I could demonstrate to you that when you take red and you hold it up and you put another piece of red cellophane in front of it, the one on the backside will disappear. That's what Jesus does for your sins. They disappear. He gets rid of them. And God sees the sins of man as red like crimson, uh, red as scarlet. You remember the scarlet th uh, thread that uh, Rahab threw out her window on uh, the wall of Jericho. It was red. And when the judgment of God fell on Jericho, her house was the only one to stand. And that petition of that wall was the only wall that stood when the walls come tumbling down. Rahab and her house was saved because of a scarlet thread. And so that's what God sees. God sees sin as red, not as black, but as, as red. And when you get down to verse number 18, he says, listen if you will repent if you will return if we can reason together if you'll get right with me if you'll get right with God he said I will do something to those sins he said they shall be white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool I want to lift out that phrase this morning where it says that your sins shall be white as snow. And here's the subject I want to preach on just for a few minutes. I want to preach on this simple thought. Let it snow. Let it snow. Let it snow. Last Sunday we had a lot of snow up here and I thought well, it's a timely message to preach on let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. I want to give you a couple of things about snow and relate them to the Savior. Because that's exactly what God does. He only deals with sins through his Son. You say, well Jesus didn't come in the Old Testament. He came in the New Testament. Here's the catch. The Old Testament looked forward to Calvary. When you get to the New Testament, we look back at Calvary. If you're going to get saved by the grace of God, you're going to have to look to Calvary. You're going to have to look to Jesus. You're going to have to look to the old rugged cross. Whether it's Old Testament, whether it's New Testament. Everything points to Calvary. And even though they want to deny the fact that Jesus even existed and that he really did not uh, accomplish what he said he was going to do, I tell you one thing it did do, it changed our calendars. Because those same atheists that don't believe in God have to point to a B.C. and an A.D. because there was a man that came to this earth that changed everything. Everything. And so when I look at this, this thought this morning of snow, you, are you, you're, you're aware of the fact that it is a miracle for snow to take place. Because one degree hotter, it's rain. One degree colder, it's what? Ice. Sleet. You realize that you've got to have the perfect temperature for it to snow. It's easier for it to rain and it's easier for it to sleet. It's a miracle if it turns into snow. I tell you one thing about snow, everybody loves it. Everybody. Except for people in Alaska and maybe Canada. But everybody, I mean, especially in the South, we love it because we never see it. But when the kids see it for the first time, they're like, what is that? Oh, they, 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 they light up like a Christmas tree. You know, I got a, we got a Boston Terrier, and I thought, I, there's no telling what he's going to think about it. He walked out in the front yard, and he came back to me and reported. He said, why did you cover my yard in ice? 
He won't know what, what was this white stuff. And the kids went out there and had a snowball fight with Chip. He was having a blast in it. I mean, he was rolling around in that mess. He didn't even have a jacket on. No shoes, no socks. I don't know how he's doing it, but he did it. I was, free, I was out there freezing to death. But for snow to take place, it is an absolute miracle of God. For the weather to be just right, you've got to have every, everything has to align correctly. And if I wanted to be a meteorologist, you know, I guess I would have went down that path and I could tell you the formula that it causes to make snow. But I'm not a meteorologist. But I will tell you that it is near impossible for snow to actually make. It's because you, either you've got rain or you've got ice or you've got sleet. And half the time, we always get sleet. We never get snow. And so for us to get snow, I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. I mean, we can throw snowballs at one another. We can go outside and build a snowman. Amen. We, there's a lot of things you can do with snow, but you can't do it with rain. And you sure can't do it with sleet and ice. You can drive in snow, but you ain't going to drive in ice. I don't care if you got a four-wheel drive or an 18-wheel drive. Ice, you're going to slide on it, good neighbor. You're going to slide. And I was thinking about the, this passage of Scripture. God said, I, I can take your red sins and I can make them as white as snow. And I thought about the fact of precipitation. That's my first point, is the precipitation of snow. Do you know where snow happens? It don't happen down here. You know where, you know where, the, you know where the miracle happens? Up there. That's where it begins. And the only way you know it's snowing is God allows it to fall down here. You know, there's a lot of people that don't understand salvation. They don't understand God because they can't see it. They're blinded. The God, the God of this world has blinded their minds that they cannot believe. And so they look up and they say, well, there is no God. There was an astronaut one time. He said, we've been to the farthest galaxy. We've been to the highest heights. We've been to the moon and back. And he said, there is no God. If there was a God, we would have bumped into him. I thought to myself, take off your oxygen mask and you'll meet him real quick like. There is a God. And it is a miracle that he came to where we are. It's a miracle that God brought his son to this earth. There's no reason outside of the grace of God why Jesus would even want to come to this earth. But he did. And that is the greatest news. That's the best news. Is the precipitation. Is that God was forming a miracle. Before the foundation of the world ever existed, God had a solution to man's sin. It's the precipitation of Christ. I want to read a couple of passages here in the book of John. John's gospel, chapter number one, talking about this precipitation. This man by the name of Jesus. Let's look at this. In the beginning was the word. Is there any English majors here this morning? Did you, read, did you get what I just read? In the beginning was the word. Let me tell you what God can do. God can get you all the way back to the beginning and then when he gets you there, he'll look at you and say, was. Just saying, that's pretty cool. I can get you to the beginning and I can't say was. I can take you all the, bit, all the way back to September the 18th, 1982 when I existed and I can't tell you nothing before that. But God can. You know why? Because time means nothing to God. That's what makes him so cool. That's what makes him so unique. In the beginning was. Now that I've got you all the way to the start point, now that I've got you all the way back, at, all the way at the beginning, was. That's just to tick off some philosophers. Well, there's a mistake in the Bible because you can't have a was after the beginning unless you're God. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things that were made, nothing was made without Him. Listen to this. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now watch this. The Bible says this. And verse 10, and he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. 
Verse 11, he came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And the word was made flesh, and the word dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You realize that he is the precipitation. The only way God can turn your sins from the crimson red that they are unto white as snow is you've got to have the precipitation and I know who he is this morning he is the miracle he is the God man he is the one that was formed before the foundation of the world and God done that miracle everything happened right on time right in God's time everything came together and when it was time God sent his son and the songwriter said they called him Jesus say why are you getting so excited because there was a day that I didn't believe that and my life was miserable but then I heard the story about how he washed away sins and I'm telling you my life completely totally radically changed but one thing about snow is you have the precipitation that happens up there, not down here. It's a miracle that takes place somewhere beyond the blue, somewhere where we can't see and where we can't reach. But thank God, the miracle comes to where we are. The snow comes down and lays on the ground and we actually get to hold it and touch it and feel it and experience it. But then there's the accumulation. You've got the precipitation, but then there's the accumulation you know what makes snow so special don't you it accumulates you don't get to miss school on a dusting you don't get to miss school when it's a dusting you got to have accumulation and then you get out of school you don't have to go to work if it's accumulating I'll never forget when I got my first job in Atlanta, I worked for P&D Printing, and I remember it came a good dusting. And I called into work. I said, it's snowing. I ain't going to be able to make it. I'll never forget what she said to me on the phone. I had blessed God if I'm here, and you're going to be here too. I said, it's snowing at my house. She said, then you just stayed with me last night. There ain't no snow where I live. I said, I can't get in. She said, yes, you can. And I need your help this morning. That's my supervisor. I got out on the road and I thought, man, I wish it would have accumulated last night. Man, I don't want to go to work. Man, I wanted to call in sick. It ain't special until it accumulates. Let me tell you what makes Jesus special to me this morning. He didn't just come to this earth, but he came here and accumulated. It started out in a manger scene when there was no room for Mary in the inn. And there was no room for Jesus and Mary and Joseph. Can I tell you something? There still is no room for Jesus today. They've kicked him out of the government. They've kicked him out of schools. And I know they've kicked him out of some of the churches. People don't want God. They want it their way or the highway. But thank God he came anyhow. Even though there was no room. He came anyhow. They wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Do you know what swaddling clothes is? That's embalming clothes. That's dead man's clothes. You know what's special about that? He was born, Brother Bill, to die. His goal was to come and die for the sins of humanity, for the sins of all mankind. And the snow began to fall, and it was accumulated in the manger scene. And guess who shows up at the birth? Three wise men from the east bearing gifts I'm talking expensive gifts talking about one of the first baby showers in the Bible is in the book of Luke chapter number 2 you ought to read it sometime and they brought in gold and frankincense and myrrh and Joseph is going praise God I just got through writing a check to the federal government for taxes and I doesn't have enough money left over but ain't God good amen to give us so many blessings you pay your bills God will take care of you amen you take hey you pay your bills God will take care of you 
God threw him a baby shower in that manger scene. And here comes the three wise men. By the way, wise men still seek him today. A fool says his heart, there is no God. That's right. That's right. You said, there ain't no God. Well, I read your name in the Bible. The Bible said you're a fool. There is no God. Then the angels appear to the shepherds. And I mean, they, they were rejoicing in the highest on earth. And then they take him from the manger scene. They take him to the, 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 the preacher. And uh, the preacher takes him into the temple. And he holds up baby Jesus. Remember what he said? He said, mine eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. I mean, God promised that preacher he wouldn't die until he saw the salvation of the Lord and he was able to hold baby Jesus and dedicate him unto the Lord. And you, you know what's happening? That's, that is accumulation. And then there's 12 years that we, we really don't read about the life of Jesus until he's 12 years old. He goes from manger scene all the way up to 12 years old. And so during that time, we, we don't know what went on. We don't really know what happened. But we know that at the age of 12, he was quoting Old Testament scriptures by heart. You know why? You know why he knew the Old Testament by heart? Because in G, Gen, uh, because of John chapter 1, verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He didn't just know the Word. He was the Word. <laughs> That's how he was able to quote it. He was quoting it 12 years old. He was quoting the Old Testament to doctors and men of renown. He astonished them with his understanding and his answers of the Scriptures. In John chapter number 2, they had the, the marriage at Canaan. How many remembers that old story? And in John chapter number 2, they had a bunch of water, and Jesus walked in there and turned it into wine. You say, is it okay to drink wine, Brother Adam? Absolutely. As long as Jesus can take your H2O and turn it into wine, I say drink it all day long. Amen. <laughs> maturity. And he builds up and then his miracles start happening. So you got the manger. You've got his maturity. Then these miracles. And then in John chapter number four, it starts his earthly ministry. He starts calling in disciples. He starts picking Peter, James, and John and pulls them in. You know, the sons of thunder, the brothers of Zebedee. John chapter number four he meets the woman at Samaria he tells her listen woman he said if you'll drink of this water you'll never thirst again you say what happened she left her pail she hit the trail and she couldn't wait to go tell that she wasn't going to hell that's what happened in John chapter four John chapter number 5, there was a man over by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus passed by his way, touched and healed him. In John chapter number 6, he feeds the 5,000 and then he feeds the 4,000. Amen. And then all of a sudden in chapter 7, you see his teaching of the Beatitudes. And then in chapter number 9, he heals the blind. But in chapter number 11, one of his greatest miracles is when Lazarus was dead for four days and they said all hope is gone and there's nothing else we can do. But thank God the master showed up. Amen. Jesus never preached a funeral. He always gave they always had to give a refund to the undertaker in the funeral home when Jesus came to the funeral because nobody could die around the resurrection and life. And he said Lazarus come forth and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot. He's healing the blind. He's raising the dead. I'm telling you there's something about this precipitation. There's something about this accumulation. He was different than any other prophet that ever lived I'm telling you he is the only thing that can take your sins and make them white as snow he is our precipitation he is our accumulation but then there's the sad part about snow it's the evaporation I remember Kids worked so hard and they built them snowmen out in the front yard. You better not touch them either, buddy. They'll chop your head off you mess with their snowmen. We'll, we'll leave and we'll come back and you, they start seeing the snows leaving the ground. And they, oh, they're so disappointed. Daddy, can we just, can we sled one more time? They're over in a mud puddle. There's, there's a patch of ice at the top of the hill. There's a patch at the bottom. There's grass in the middle and they're wanting to go sledding. It's the worst part. It's the evaporation. You got to go back to work. Isn't that horrible? You got to go back to school. Oh, it's terrible. You can't lay in bed. You can't just let the sun warm your feet anymore. 
It's evaporating. That's the worst part. It's the worst part. One of my favorite parts in the movie, uh, that Disney movie Frozen, was when Olaf was singing and wanting the sun. I thought, I was sitting there watching that with the kids, and I thought, if that snowman just knew, if he's singing and begging for the sun, he's going to melt away. All that's going to be left is a corn pipe and a button nose and two eyes made out of coal. Olaf will be, Dad, don't sing about the sun, Olaf. Then he warms himself next to the fire and he loves it. And then all of a sudden he starts melting. And I saw the, the, the faces of my kids. They go, oh, Wolf died. <laughs> Remember they had to rush to get him back outside real quick. Poor old Olaf. There ain't nobody like Disney, man. They put, they put some crazy stuff together. I remember we, we would leave and we'd go down to Gainesville. We'd come back and the kids like, there's still snow on the ground. There's still snow on the ground. But as it evaporates, as it begins to leave, it's kind of a sad time. Go to John chapter number 14. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You know why he said that, don't you? Because he just told them he's leaving. He just told them that the precipitation has fell. The precipitation has accumulated. And now there must be an evaporation. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I'm going to tell you something. It ain't going to happen unless there's an evaporation. He told his disciples at the upper room, tonight somebody's going to betray me. The one, there's one that sits at the table. And they begin to look at each other and say, is it I? Is it me? Lord, who is it? He said, it's the one that receiveth the sop. And the Bible said that he gave Judas the sop. And the Bible said that he went out immediately. Listen to what the Bible said. And it was night. Brother Bill, it was a night that saw no morning. It was a sunset that never saw a sunrise. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus knows which one's his and which one ain't. There's a lot of people come to church for the first time and they walk out that door and what they don't realize is it's night and they'll never be back. Judas betrays him with a kiss and he, he ends up being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane where he began to pray and his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And he was being pressed. And there there they, they came to the garden and they arrested him and then they took him to Gabbatha. And they laid our Savior at the whipping post. The disciples ran away there in hiding and just a handful follow along as they whip him and they beat him and they mock him and they scourge him. They pluck the beard from his face. You say, man, I got it hard. People are talking about me. Hey, listen, Jesus had it a whole lot worse. Well, I just ain't going back down there to that church. They hurt my feelings. Well, bless your heart. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a reed in his hand, a crown on his head, and, and they took him to bloody Golgotha. They took him to Calvary. And there they nailed his precious hands to an old rugged cross and lifted him up between heaven and between heaven and hell on this earth. And he stretched out his arms and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And there is where Jesus, our precipitation, our accumulation, that's where he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the Bible said he gave up the ghost. Do you know what happened? He evaporated. He's gone. He left. That's what happens to snow. It starts up there. It falls down here. It accumulates. And then it begins to evaporate. And you know what happens when it evaporates? It don't go that way. I'm, no, I'm telling you, I'm no scientific major, but I do know steam goes one way. 
up. Father, into thy hands I give up. The Bible said he gave up the ghost. When you die, you better hope you're going up. If you're going down, your sins may still be like scarlet. They, they still may be red like crimson if you go down. It's like that old man told his wife, he said, you need to put all my stuff when I die in the attic. I want, because when I leave here, I'm going to stop by the attic. I'm going to pick up my suitcase and take it to heaven when I die. Well, that old man died. His boy went up there in the attic and looked, and that suitcase was still there. He told his mom, he said, I told you you should have put it in the basement. Say amen right there. Amen. That's right. Got my stuff in the attic, good neighbor. It ain't in the basement. My mother in law stuff, we put it in the basement. Amen. The Bible says, he said, he said, I'm, he said listen guys, he said, listen to this. I'm going to read this verse. It, it, it's a good verse. Isaiah chapter number 55 and verse number 10. For as the rain cometh down, there's your precipitation, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Listen at verse number 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I send it. Hey, listen, as the snow begins to evaporate, we may not be able to see it. We may not be able to comprehend it. It's still there. It's still doing its work. Can I tell you, even though Jesus came and he lived amongst us for 33 years, yes, he went back. Yes, he evaporated. Yes, he went up. But guess what he left us with? Thank God he left us with his word. And whithersoever it goeth, it prospereth. Man, I'm telling you, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Word of God. You wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Word of God. The Word of God is what gives, uh, uh, brings forth and buds and gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, the Word of God. Thank God for the evaporation. Amen? It's like a vapor. Where's the, I got another verse, John 14. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He said, listen, guys, he said, don't be sad. Don't be sad, he said, because if, he said, if I don't leave, if I don't evaporate, if I don't go up, he can't come. John chapter number 14 and verse number 18 says this, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter and he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. In you. Amen. Yes, it's evaporated. Yes, it's going up. But thank God, even though you can't see it, even though you can't tangibly touch it, there's still a Spirit of God, whether you believe it or not. You say, well, I don't believe in the Spirit of God. Then I guess you're a non-believer. But I believe in him this morning because he lives and dwells within my heart. He walks with me. He talks with me a long life's weary road. He lives. He lives. He lives within my heart. So, you've got the precipitation of snow. What was the second one? The accum Stop cheating. You've got the accumulation. Then you've got the evaporation. But I tell you something else that snow does that rain can't accomplish, sleet can't accomplish. I call it the purification of the snow. The purification of the snow. Everybody, when they see snow, they always identify it as being a certain color. White. I challenge you to do this. And I know I'm right. I've done it before. Go pick you any dealership you want. Whether it be Ford, Chevrolet, Toyota, go pick you out a good dealership. Find you the whitest car on that lot. And you let it snow. And you let it accumulate. And that snow will pile up on that car or that truck or that SUV. 
And if you stand right beside it, that white car will all of a sudden look like an off-white or a dirty white. Or you might even say, I didn't even, it don't even look white. Why is that? Because the snow is so much more whiter. It's whiter. It's, it's the purification. You know, I think, uh, I think ourselves as sometimes being like that white car. Boy, we think we look good. We think we've, we think we've met the mark. Man, we have got it made. But I'm telling you, once Jesus comes and he accumulates and he puts himself on you and around you, you realize just how dirty you really are. I'm not as white as he is. I'm not as bright as he is. I'm not as pure as he is. Man, he's pure. Man, he's white. Man, he's holy. That's what he does. The Bible says our righteousness in the sight of God is as filthy rags. Think about that. You take, you take the most purest man, the most holiest man. Let's take, for example, the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul being a good man and a holy man and a godly man. Or one of the disciples, John the Beloved. A good man, a holy man, a godly man. Sold out, serving the Lord. You line them up next to Jesus. Honey, they're an off-white what they are. They're off. You realize you have a white house and you let snow fall? That house don't look as white as it used to. Say amen right there. I was looking at, I was watching, I was watching pictures of the, of the White House. They were showing it on, on Fox News and the snow was, just, man, it was just falling. And I thought, I was looking at that screen. And I said, is something wrong with my color on my TV? Something wrong with it? I mean, have I got the contrast just right on this Vizio? There's got to be something. I thought that house was white. No, 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 no. It's off white compared to what's falling around it. That's just like Jesus. That's just like God. He's so holy and he's so pure and he's so bright. Nothing mag There's no majesty that can magnify as great as he is. There is no other name in heaven given whereby you must be saved. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's nobody like him. That piano looks white this morning, but you let snow accumulate on it, it won't look as white, and it won't look as pretty as that white snow. You might as well say amen right there. And I'm telling you, God can make snow white like nobody else can. That, that's God just saying, listen, I know you thought your white was good. You thought your white was great. They've got pearl white. They've got off white. They've got bright white. They've got soft white. They've got hard white. They've got daylight. They've got all these. God lets it snow and they go, wow. Now, how did he get that so white? You know, that's what it'll take to wash away your sins. That's what it'll take to get you to where God can accept you is his purification process. Not man's, but God's. Matthew 28, verse number three, describes his countenance, talking about the Son of God. Listen to this. This is, you know, this is Mount Transfiguration. Matthew chapter number 28, and verse number three says this. His countenance was like lightning. His raiment was white as snow. <laughs> the only way that they could describe Jesus on Mount Transfiguration, when John Peter saw him up on Mount Transfiguration, the only way they knew, the best way they knew to explain him to where we could understand it, they said he was his his face was was like lightning and his clothes was as white as snow. <laughs> Mark chapter number nine and verse number three, what does it say? Mark 9, 3. You got that one, Eric? I didn't know how fast you are on that. Mark 9, 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. I'm just giving you some descriptions here of Jesus. Hey, try Re Revelation 1, 14. Revelation 1, 14. What does it say? His head and his hairs 
were white as wool, as white as what? Snow. Let it snow, let it snow, <laughs> let it snow. Amen. Praise God. His eyes were a flame of fire, but he was white as snow. No wonder the psalmist said this. David was our psalmist. And he said, purge me with hyssop, O Lord, and I shall be clean. He said, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. <laughs> that's, what, that's what David said. <laughs> By the way, looking back at our text in Isaiah, He said that our sins are like scarlet. They're red like crimson. But if we repent and we get right, they shall be white as snow. Has anybody in here ever tried to wash snow? You know what happens if you were to try to wash it. Just, just, hey, I'm talking, where did it go? What snow are you talking about? You try to wash snow, it'll disappear. It'll evaporate. You can't do it. It's impossible. Do you realize that's what happened the night that I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and save my old wretched soul. You know what happened? God began to wash away my sins. And they evaporated. The psalmist said, as far as the east is from west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The songwriter said, oh happy day, oh happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Amen. He taught me how to watch and pray and sing and shout and rejoice each and every day. Oh happy day, oh happy day, when Jesus washed and washed our sins away away can I say to you this morning let it snow let it snow let it snow by the way can I lift out a few phrases out of the old Dean Martin song this morning I'll get Manny to come on the piano Paul would have said in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 1 all oh, the weather outside is frightful but Jeremiah would have responded and said, but the fire inside is so delightful. And Abraham, a stranger and a pilgrim, he would have responded by saying, and since we have no place to go, they all three would have sang, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. If we were to interview the Apostle Paul, Paul would say this, Oh, how I hate going out in the storm, Acts 27. But Jesus, if you'll really hold me tight, all the way home I'll be warm. <laughs> John, the revelator, would say these words in a day of apostasy and of falling away and false prophets and the fire, it's slowly dying. And then he looks to heaven and says, but my Lord, we're still goodbying. But Lord, as long as you love me so, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Can I tell you there's more truth in that song than what you realize this morning? Because as soon as you walk out those doors, the weather outside is frightful. But you know we've got a fire shut up in our bones called the Word of God. Jeremiah said it's like a fire shut up in my bones. Yes, the weather outside is frightful. Yes, there's bad times. Yes, there's hard times. Yes, there's terrible times. But there's a fire shut up in my bones that was put there by God Almighty. And no matter how bad it gets, and no matter how frightful it gets, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow, because we've got a fire shut up in our bones. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. Can I read it one more time? 
Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank you, God, this morning for the invitation. I'm glad to know that in 2017, your arms are still open wide. The call still goes forth. Come unto me, all you that are laden, and heavy laden. I'll, I'll give you rest. Lord, thank you that the call is still going out. Come now, come now, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. God, I'm glad you're still in the sin washing business. I'm glad, God, you're still in the soul saving business. I'm glad to know, God, that no matter how frightful it is outside, the fire inside still a burning. Lord, I'm glad to know that you've washed away all sin. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Lord, they're buried in the deepest sea. They're gone. They're gone. Thank you, Lord, that our sins have been washed away. Lord, this season, may we reflect on this verse of Scripture. And may we say, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Thank you, Lord, for the day that it snowed in my life. Lord, the precipitation came to where I was when I could not go to where it was. Lord, he came to me. Lord, Jesus accumulated in my life. And one of these glad days when the eastern sky splits and the Lord calls his children home, I'm evaporating just like he did. I'm leaving out of here on a taxi cloud and I'm headed for worlds unknown. And this old world can say, oh, Brother Adam, he just evaporated. He left out with the rest of them. Lord, I'm looking for that thousand-year millennial rain. Praise God. Let it snow. Let it snow. Let it snow. Lord Jesus, we love you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can take by way of application and apply these truths and these scriptures to our hearts. Help us, Lord, take them with us as we go our separate ways. Bless this invitation. Lord, if there's somebody here that don't know you that needs to be saved, let us take a Bible and show them how they can come to know the Savior, how they can come and get their sins washed away. Lord, thank you for that this morning. Bless now. Bless Amanda as she sings. Christ's name. We're standing together. Heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Y'all be praying. You might want to just come around and thank him this morning for washing away all your sins and making them white as snow. I can take a whole upon the 
water and I can't calm a raging sea but I know a man who can I can't cause blinded eyes to open or make the lame to walk again oh but I Savior, 